Is this it? That's almost like that's like an almost stamp. Right? Almost. Good try. You're a good tryer. <laughs> You're a good tryer. Um, our I when I have those, I have to wear my boots. It started in just a few minutes. We just wait for everyone to arrive. Vet Corps members, I understand you all have uh, some paperwork that needs to be stamped, right? Vet uh, Corps members, if you need the stamp for your paperwork, um, I'll put it over here. Make sure you stamp it at some point in the discussion. We'll give it just a few more minutes to allow everyone to find out over here. I think it'll be up there. I'll call it to you. Okay. 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 Yeah, Morris, I talked to Morris, and she was going to make words. But if you're, 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 if you're,
Okay, so this is our agenda. Uh, we're going to go over uh, broad themes uh, the, from the fellow from the administration all the way through uh, the VA, uh, what, our, what our broad themes are, what our fo areas of focus are, and then we're going to go jump right into the PACT Act and do a little uh, update on, on where we are with that. And then hiring automation, uh, that's uh, key to how we are going to move forward in VBA. And then um, some up updates on compensation service, our uh, VA Disability Compensation Program, and the um, ever uh, important update on the claim factor. Um, and then one that I'm extremely passionate to uh, uh, give you some information on, which is appeals modernization efforts that I've been involved in for the last decade. And, and, uh, things that we're doing that are pretty unique to the, the Seattle VA Regional Office. And updates to our uh, Veterans Readiness and Employment Program. And uh, then we'll just provide general updates. So that's our agenda for today. So for the themes, uh, just uh, kind of from the President to the VA Secretary, Everything that we do, veterans at the center of everything that we do, and at the end of the day, it's being accountable to veterans. So those who have served our country and um, are filing claims, are seeking benefits from VA, and it's not just compensation. Um, we're talking about uh, all the benefits, uh, entitlements, and um, support that we provide veterans, housing, and education, uh, the compensation, pension, the appeals. Um, so, so many different areas uh, that are part of the, our commitment to serving veterans and the things that, that we are responsible for doing. Um, the other thing that uh, I want to share with you is just at the end of the day, it's getting things done. We can have a lot of, uh, it can be a lot of talking, there can be a lot of initiatives, but at the end of the day, it's making sure that we are taking action to serve our veterans and what those specific things are. So that's the call to action, and as the Secretary has said, the President has said to the Secretary, we're here to fight like hell for our veterans. Um, sometimes in the, uh, uh, we do live in a big bureaucracy, we'll be the first to admit that. And sometimes it, it, there is a lot that needs to go on every day, that the hard work that goes on every day that results in the big changes that are going to make an impact in veterans' lives. So uh, veterans being the center of everything that, we're, that we do and being accountable, uh, getting things done, and ensuring that we follow the president's charter, fighting like health and veterans. Um, so last year we made promises to uh, supporting our veterans um, and that involved veterans who are uh, filing claims, supplemental claims, um, and claims for individual unemployability. Um, and you can see that here's a, just a quick overview of what that looks like. 63% of the pending claims are supplemental and 37% of the claims are original. So if you just wanted to break down on what's, what the initial claims are and what the supplemental claims are, 10% of the veterans are filing claims for, 10% um, um, of veterans filing supplemental claims already have a 100% disability rating or qualify for IU. 81% uh, of the veterans filing supplemental claims are receiving some level of monetary benefit and 48% are filing supplemental claims and are already rated at 50% or higher. So the reason I, I shared this with you is because it's sometimes, sometimes important to have a profile of our veterans that we serve. Many have already um, entered the, the claim system and have already been granted benefits and are seeking um, an increase in their benefits. So it, it could be an original claim, it could be a supplemental claim. Whatever the case is, we are accountable and we owe the those veterans who are filing claims, whether they're original or uh, supplemental claims, to ensure that they're done timely and they're done with accuracy. So that's kind of what we'll talk about a little bit later as we talk about where we are with the claims backlog. And then 
the unity agenda for VA uh, are, are part of this unity agenda to support the president's call to action. Um, and it's one that requires not just action on part of VA, but action for us to reach out to a broad coalition of community stakeholders. So that's why we come to uh, events like this. That's why we are involved in community veteran engagement boards. Um, and I remember a secretary we had, a former secretary we had, Bob McDonald, um, had this saying that, that always resonated with me. We as leaders cannot have a bunker mentality. We have to get out of our offices and we have to be out in the community. And I, I felt very strongly about that. And uh, uh, that's exactly what we do in the CLR. We are, uh, one thing that we do is make sure that we are actively seeking out partnerships. So those complementary relationships can be part of what it is to support this unity agenda. And that is supporting and reducing uh, homelessness. We know that's, that's an issue that we have to continue to fight. So you can't rest until we ensure every veteran has a, has a place to live. Supporting those veterans who have financial hardship um, and understanding that veterans uh, are suffering from environmental exposures. So uh, we've already done some work in that area, much more to come. Um, and also supporting veterans by training uh, for VA and non-VA providers. Some of that is, uh, a lot of that is done in VHA as well. So uh, those are kind of our broad themes of supporting um, the president's agenda and what the VA's agenda looks like. So reducing homelessness, financial hardship. From January through June 2022, almost 19,000 veterans have been placed into permanent housing. And as I mentioned before about the partnerships, a great example is VA and HUD aligning efforts to make sure that we're focusing on um, veteran homelessness. So these two large departments working together and collectively utilizing our resources to uh, focus on, on this important issue of reducing, eliminating veteran homelessness. Um, and it just doesn't stop with us working with HUD. Um, I would say that working with uh, our partners in WDVA, for example, working with uh, county partners. Uh, and in Seattle, we work very closely with King County. Uh, if we're out East Spokane County, perhaps. So we've got to make sure that those partnerships at the county, state level, augment the federal partnerships that are, that are already in place. So it really does take a community effort to support veterans reducing homelessness with the goal of eliminating veteran homelessness. So most of what I want to update you today is on the PAC Act. And uh, you've all heard about it, I'm sure. The Sergeant Veterans First Class Keith Robinson honoring and promise to address Comprehensive Toxics Act. Who wants to say that? It's a mouthful, but we call it the PAC Act. And uh, it is a deep commitment to serving those who have um, served our country in Iraq, <coughs> Afghanistan, and many other locations. Um, and it adds 20 new presumptive conditions for burn pits and other toxic exposures and has more presumptive uh, locations for Agent Orange and radiation. You know, in a decade ago, we added three new Agent Orange presumptive conditions. One of the big ones was the scheme of disease. So what the PAC Act does is doubles down on that, and now hypertension is recognized as an Agent Orange presumptive condition. So, as we were um, doing work on understanding what this what this workload is going to look like, a lot of it did hinge on hypertension. The fact that hypertension is included in the PAC Act is huge, and it is one perhaps one of the biggest expansions in veterans' benefits in our history. As, as I said, in my nearly 30-year career working for the VA, 
Uh, I've seen many um, important pieces of legislation that have been signed that expand the benefits of veteran. This is one of the biggest, for sure. And um, because it is one of the biggest, um, a lot of work has to go into supporting. So let me just quickly go through the cancers and then I'll present them. Brain cancer, uh, gastrointestinal cancer of any type, glioblastoma, head cancer of any type, kidney cancer, lymphatic cancer, lymphoma of any type, melanoma, <coughs> neck cancer, pancreatic cancer, reproductive cancer of any type, and respiratory cancer of any type. And now these illnesses are also presumptive due to birth and exposure, asthma that was diagnosed after service, chronic bronchitis, COPD, chronic rhinitis, and chronic sinusitis. In addition to chronic constrictive bronchiolitis and obliterated bronchiolitis, emphysema, granulitis, disease, interstitial lung disease, pleuritis, pulmonary fibrosis, and sarcoidosis. So just real quickly, those are the uh, presumptive conditions, burn pit exposures, and now the fact that also includes new agent orange presumptive conditions I just mentioned, hypertension, and also monoclonal of undetermined significance or NGES. And the new presumptive locations uh, include any uh, U.S. or Royal Thai military base in Thailand from those January 9, 1962 through June 30, 1976. Laos from December 1, 1965 through September 3, 1969. Cambodia. Or Crescent, um, Camp Phong Chong Province from April 16, 1969 through April 30, 1969, Guam or American Samoa, and the Johnston Atoll. So I know you can read it and all read, but just want to make sure that you highlighted that these are new presumptive locations and that's important in us understanding uh, where presumption will be conceded. So we've added uh, these three new response efforts to the list of presumptive conditions, the cleanup of the Anahuatak Atoll, um, the cleanup of the Air Force B-52 bomber carrying nuclear weapons off the coast of Palomora, Spain, and um, the B-52 bomber carrying nuclear weapons near the Tool Air Force Base in Greenland. Um, so those are important additions to pack that based on radiation um, locations. So I just did a lot, and there's a lot in the pack that. And what I would say is uh, here is the uh, website that you can go to to get any information about the PAC Act. And there's also this 1800 My VA 411 where you can get more information. So part of what we're doing today is the outreach plan to inform our stakeholders and veterans of the PAC Act and all of the new presumptive conditions, whether they're due, due to burn pit exposure or due to Agent Orange uh, additional presumptive conditions additional locations that are recognized for Agent Orange exposure, radiation. So I just went through all of that. So we want to make sure that this information is shared as widely as possible. One of the success factors, I would call it, of this outreach is getting more claims in, this, in the system. So that, that's actually a good thing, because that means we're getting the word out veterans who um, have these conditions are filing claims and we can make sure that we're getting ready to process these claims. So before I go into this, I did want to share with you where we are right now in, in that process. So much like Blue Water Navy and much like we did with appeals modernization, uh, 
um, there's a period of time where we have to write regulations, we have to develop policies and procedures to ensure that when we start to process these claims, we have all of that foundational information ready, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. So uh, August 10th, the legislation was signed, and that presumption is pr presumably effective August 10th. And now the important work starts to get the regulatory, sub-regulatory packages together so that we can be ready, effective January 1st of 2023 to actually start processing this claim. So that's, that's where we are from the standpoint of regulations, policies, procedures. And again, the, the template for that, the most recent one was the Blue Water Navy, which uh, was sort of a similar effort in terms of getting ready. So the state of readiness that I'm alluding to is not just on the regulatory front, getting the policies and procedures and everything together, but also a readiness of our systems, making sure that the systems that we have in place are um, tested and validated so that come January 1st, they are ready to go. Um, so that means looking at our training programs. It means um, making sure that we are doing recruitment to onboard, to get ready to onboard new employees. Um, and making sure that um, all of the support that is necessary for that, the HR community whatnot is in place. This is gonna be a big effort it's going to, we need to make sure that we are not wasting any time getting ready. And that's exactly, again, what's happening right now in regional offices like Seattle. We are uh, getting into this maximum state of readiness so that the fact that January 1st, we can get the ground running. What we've already done from the hiring perspective, we've already onboarded 2,000 employees nationwide. And Definitely that was a big lift. Um, those getting 2,000 employees on board requires a lot in the area of recruitment, onboarding, training, um, and that's sort of like I would call the initial down payment to additional hiring that VBA has to do in order to make sure that we have the resources available. So fortunately, we have the support from Congress um, to be able to have the budget to hire additional claims processors. But whenever whenever that happens, whatever that number is, we still don't know what the final number is for this next round of hiring. But I can say it's gonna be more than this 2,000 that we've already hired. And we've, we've had some lessons learned from the big hiring surge and it's always difficult, I'll tell you, to hire large numbers at one time. It, it, you, even an office like Seattle, which is one of the largest in the BBA, and then Steve can attest to this, um, you get tested in ways that you never imagined. And uh, one thing we've become pretty good at in Seattle is making sure that from day one, an employee who starts has, is ready to go. That means they have a computer, which sometimes it's easier said than done with supply chain issues. That means they, they have all their credentials. They have a PIV card. If you, if you don't have one of these, that computer is as good as a lot. You have to be able to, um, and this this credentialing requires background checks and all of this. So, so not as easy as, okay, here's a computer, open a computer and start training. No, a lot has to go into getting all of our systems in place. And, We've tested that, and I think we've become pretty good at it, and we, under, we understand where some of the pain points are. Um, our human resources, um, we have the human capital services that provides the human resources support to all of EBA, and uh, there's been a lot of great work that's being done there to help this large scale hiring. One thing that we've done is we've sort of partnered with OPM, kind of using OPM as a subcontractor on national hiring. So one thing 
uh, you will see if you go into USA Jobs and you know anyone who's interested who has a passion for serving veterans who meets the qualifications, you will send them to USA Jobs, look for a, a, a position in VA that meets their desires, their needs, and um, the applicant may not see this, but what's happening behind the scenes is it's a big national hiring certificate with multiple locations. So you have 56 offices and not all of them are hiring different positions. So if you have a certain position, that national hiring certificate will identify the locations where that position is being hired. So the applicant can understand um, if that if the desired location they want to be in is actually hiring a certain position. So it's pretty good that we're, I think it's cool that we're doing that because what it does is it prevents us <coughs> from having to recreate this 50 plus times in different regional offices. Everything is done on a national level. So it's kind of a national hiring strategy that with these 2,000 has worked pretty well for us. Not perfect. Um, we skinned our knee a few times and figured out where there's inefficiencies in the system that we can put back for this next round of hiring, which will be greater than the 2,000 that we've already hired. You know, it's, it's interesting when I think of, I worked in VA central office 20 years ago, and VBA was um, the size of the Veterans Veterans Administration and all the leading offices was a quarter of what it is now. I mean, it, uh, the, the amount of growth that we've had has been remarkable, but also the amount of benefits that we provide, that um, total <coughs> mandatory entitlements that we provide the veterans from that time, if you look at 20 years ago to now, has grown fivefold from 20, 20 billion a year to where we are now, which is 100 billion a year. So it's remarkable the uh, uh, building of that so can 100 billion uh, is what the total entitlements that are given to um, provide the veterans through BBA. And actually, if, if you look at the general operating expense, which is what it takes to hire pay someone's salary, uh, facilities, and all the other support system. It's actually a pretty efficient <coughs> system. You wouldn't think so, but it ends up being about five cents on the dollar for general operating expenses for every dollar mandatory entitlement that is delivered to them. So VBA has, uh, because we're a large enterprise, and we really are a even though we have a network of offices spread out across the country or more of one enterprise and uh, we're able to achieve those gains through centralization, economies of scale, and efficiencies. And I say that because people don't normally associate efficiency with the federal government, but um, <laughs> there, there are efficiencies that uh, come through size. We, we definitely have our pain points. I'll be the first to admit it. You know, with this bureaucracy, that, that is the definition of um, federal agencies bureaucracy. But um, I would say a lot of those rules and regulations are in for a good reason. You know, for a good reason. Um, so I talked about hiring. I talked about the 2,000 um, things processes that we've already hired for this initial um, expansion of benefits and the additional hiring that we'll do. One thing that we know is that we're not going to hire our way to success. That is just not going to be a long-term strategy for success. So definitely bringing on additional um, employees, the hiring is a part of it. But um, I would say another critical element that is absolutely a pillar of our foundation is automation. Um, you know, I, I, I'll take you back to my time machine. The, the VA that I hired to 30 years ago hadn't changed a lot since World War II. They were still, we were still, we still had typing tools, we were still dictating ratings, um, and we, we hadn't really fully crossed this new thing called a computer. Um, so that was seriously the, the, the VA of, 30 years ago, and since then, a lot has changed, and 
10 years ago, one of the most remarkable transformations occurred in the federal government, where we took five Mount Everest worth of paper and digitized it. So everything is now electronic. We don't have, if you go to a VA regional office, we don't house any more paper. Everything is in the Veterans Benefits Management System. Everything is electronic. And it really was one of the greatest transformations in the federal government. That was, that happened 10 years ago. That's when we started doing change really well, I thought. Uh, so we actually have a successful history of transformation. And we can build off that to do this automation, which is where we are now. So the automation piece of it is, it's not about getting rid of employees, because we need all the employees plus more. It's helping them um, through having systems in place that allow us to arrive at decisions that are more accurate and um, ones that we can do more quickly. Because at the end of the day, a veteran who files a claim, what they care about is getting a check, getting their benefits. They don't care how it happens. That's all behind the scenes stuff. So that's for us to figure out. But what I will tell you is, we're not going to get to the end point that we want to reach without automation being part of it. And we can do automation because we're completely digital. We don't have any paper. So um, we can write coding to make sure that there's a, a lot of what we do um, has prescribed rules, like when to order an exam, a VA exam, and what VA exam to order. Um, a lot of that development work that we do can be automated um, and can be done faster and more accurately. So we're, we're embracing, we're all in on automation. Um, I will tell you that right now automation is being tested at our Boise office and we're seeing some really cool stuff. It's remarkable when you see a frontline leader, someone who's been doing the job for 20 years say, this is awesome because it's not a manager or someone like me who's saying who doesn't process claims. But to see a frontline worker actually see this automation work and validate that it works for them is something that um, inspires us for uh, setting a foundation for success. So I just mentioned we're doing a pilot right now in Boise, and the uh, hope is, or the uh, plan is that we're going to take that and we're going to expand it to additional sites, and then we're going to build on automation, build on the success, and make that a, a fabric of the pack back and how we're going to implement the pack back. So this is the all the, the state of readiness that um, I was just alluding to. So uh, let me just give you a quick update uh, on where we are with regard to our timeliness, our backlog. So uh, the timeliness of our Rating work and non-rating work is you can be seen through this graph here, which shows where we were in October 2021 and where we were, where we are as of now. And that the red line is the rating, the average uh, days, uh, oh, the average days a claim is pending in the system, and it's gone from 140. Um, down to uh, where we are now, about 120. So uh, that's for the rating and the, and the non rating. You, you, we also see a, a decrease from October of 2021 through October to August of 2022. In that same time frame, we've also completed more work. Um, so, fiscal year date through July, when we actually put all these numbers together, we have surpassed the previous fiscal year by. 148,545 claims. That means some good stuff happening. But the story that I'm trying to convey here is the timeliness is improving, the claims are being worked faster, and more claims are being processed. Um, what this slide doesn't tell you is this is also done because of uh, a lot of hard work from our frontline employees. Unfortunately, because of the fact that we've received so many claims in the system, we've had to 
implement mandatory overtime, which I'm not a fan of, but you know, sometimes when the uh, workload requires it, everyone has to step up. So, um, you know, Steve, and he, he runs the service center in Seattle, and his folks have been working mandatory overtime for quite some time. We gave him the summer off mandatory, but uh, the fact that September 1st, we're, we're re implementing mandatory overtime. So, um, our employees incredible work. Um, they uh, have, throughout BBA, have done remarkable work to allow us to achieve these gains. And the accuracy of the work is evident by this fact that the issue level accuracy is at 86.6%. So we, we measure all the way down to the issue. So a claim can have five different issues. So we measure the accuracy of every single issue within the claim. Hey, Prince, quick question. How is that determined? Is that, like, if an appeal overturns it later, then it was inaccurate? How do you assess accuracy? It's a random sampling of decisions that were made in the field that is sent to an independent central office staff that sort of grades us. And they, after the fact, after the decision was made, they, they look at it and assess whether or not there's a checklist that they have to go through. And um, whether or not the right decision was made, was the right evaluation provided, was the right effective date there. All of those different things are reviewed and that ends up um, determining what our quality system is. So it's a random sample, just like anything when you do a statistically significant random sample, you get an accurate depiction of what Quality. That makes sense. Thank you. No, I'd say it's exactly right. And uh, you know, I'd also say the appeals is a little bit different because the judges see things on a different area too. So uh, not the judges have a lot more leeway too than we do as claims processors. Okay. So yeah. let me build off that point. You can get a thirty percent rating for IBS, right? And you as a veteran may not agree that your IBS is 30%. But we're the decision makers who made that decision weighted that IBS is 30% because there's intermittent constipation and diarrhea and they're using what's in the rating schedule based on what the medical exam report showed. So that doesn't mean the decision is wrong, but the, the veteran may disagree that it should only be 30 So sometimes an appeal does not mean but that the fact that the veteran or the representative filed an appeal doesn't mean that the system was wrong. It could be wrong, but it doesn't necessarily mean so. We don't take how many appeals were filed as um, evidence that the decision didn't have the right quality. <clears throat> That's why this um, random quality review is what um, we use to get to the 96.6%. We get reviewed by OIG, we get reviewed by GAO, so you know, there are entities outside of VA that you know, sometimes they tell us, you know, things that we have to correct as well. They often tell us things. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a history of the VA claims backlog. And one thing that I wanted to highlight uh, is the fact that it starts at a, at a high point I did this on purpose because I wanted to illustrate a story in this, these numbers. And that's in March of 2013, we, way back, that's after the we presumptive agent orange condition. Remember, I was talking about ischemic heart disease with one of them. So, most veterans at the time, when the, when this ball was implemented for agent orange for ischemic heart disease. Most were males, and most were in their 50s, 60s, Vietnam veterans, and a lot had ischemic heart disease, I'll tell you. So we had a lot of claims coming in the system. So it was a great opportunity to make sure that we were serving those veterans who served in Vietnam who had ischemic heart disease, which is now a presumptive agent orange condition. So we received a large increase in workload as a result of successful outreach efforts like this. But 
that was before we were electronic. We were moving paper files around back then. And I would submit to you that's why we were at 611,000. We were not efficient as we are now. In fact, I was just briefing the IG on this. They were asking me some questions about what's different now versus then. And, um, the, the fact of the matter is, I remember, because I was the director of Houston at the time, and we were part of, you know, we all lived this together. All of the VAB offices lived this together. It was painful because um, we just didn't have everything in the electronic system like we do now. So we were um, taking paper files, um, shipping them to, um, medical centers where they could do the CMP exam, getting them back, sending them um, to different places. It was just not an efficient system. And then we didn't have the smart decision tools because everything was in paper, everything was automated. So the, the automation that followed um, was really the driver. So if you see, I think one of the uh, greatest, yeah, one of the, one of the, one of the Things I'm most proud of in my VA career is this 611,000. I'm living through that. That is all, for the most part, that is transformation. People, process, technology changes that we have done. The biggest driver being us being completely electronic. We had an undersecretary at the time, her name was Allison Hickey, and she was very passionate about the fact that every, every piece of paper needs to be eradicated from regional offices and should all be living in the veterans benefits management system. So that right there was one of the most remarkable achievements that VBAs have ever uh, had with when it comes to um, transformation. And at our low point, we were there at about 70,000. So we, we went from 611,000 in the claims backlog down to 70,000. And we pretty much flatlined until COVID. So when COVID hit, um, everything changed. Actually, not initially, we were fine. We sent all of our employees home, but we were a much better position than most federal agencies or most companies because we were already electronic and we're, a lot of our employees were already teleworking. So for them, going home wasn't a big deal. Fact, they loved it. And, um, we were, we were doing fine, but what created this increase here is largely supply chain issues with exams. We, veterans couldn't go to exams because remember, with COVID, you couldn't, you couldn't. The environment was such that we just we had to stop doing exams and we had to rate, if we could, based on the evidence that was in the record or whatever treatment we were there. So, um, it wasn't because we couldn't do this. We, we, we couldn't pivot and work, you know, in a fully remote sort of electronic environment. I think we proved we could. We just we didn't have the uh, supply chain impacts from the exams. Yes. And then additional presumptives um, also resulted in subsequent spikes in the workload. Nothing, nothing even remotely close to the 611,000. So this is what worries us, because with the PACT Act, we've already done the workload projections and you know, uh, the, approaching that number again is definitely something that um, we see um, if we don't have this readiness with the people process that technology again um, and I will tell you that the, the, the reality is that we're expecting even more claims than the, what led to this 611,000 that, that was the scheme heart disease but when you think of 20 presumptive conditions of toxic exposure hypertension hypertension alone is going to drive up the workload and we've actually um, have projections that talk about exactly the next 10 years how many clients we're going to get into the system. So so while we may not get the number exactly right, we know it's going to be in the order of millions of new claims coming to the system above and beyond what we would have received 
absent pattern act. So uh, we're all heavily, the secretary was the <coughs> biggest proponent of the PAC back. Um, and obviously, it made its way through Congress, had a few stalls there, but um, <laughs> we're, we're ready. And my report to you today is that we are um, ensuring we're in a maximum state of readiness in the PAC back. But we, we do acknowledge it's going to be an increase in workload. You had your hand up a few times. I'm sorry. Did you have a question? You mentioned earlier that all the employees went home. Did are, Is anyone still working from home from your office? Yes. Um, actually, well, we have, that's a great question. So sometimes they say don't waste the crisis, and we did. We actually learned a lot of things. The pandemic made us think differently. One of the ways the pandemic made us think differently as it relates to serving veterans is we found out that veterans don't have to come and see us. We can serve veterans virtually as well. So while the employees, it was great for them, for, me, for us, you know, veterans come first. Uh, employees are critical to support our employees, but the mission always comes first, and that means serving veterans. But one, one way, one thing we found out is we could serve our veterans virtually. So we created this new system. Um, it's it's called Vera. That was it with the veterans. I, I don't think exactly. Anyway, it's a, <laughs> it's a reporting. It, it's a it's a tool that veterans can use. You can go to the VA website. Um, you'll find this. So if you look at if you Google Seattle RO, you'll see our website, and it allows you to make a virtual appointment with a, with a counselor. So you don't have to come in to downtown Seattle anymore to speak to a benefits counselor. You, you, can, you can do that. You can, you can do that through our VERA system. So just like that, it allowed us to figure out. And you think we, we should have had that before the pandemic, but really the pandemic, because it didn't allow for people to come and see us, we had to open up access points so veterans could be seen virtually. So some still want to be seen in person. But I think we should always give veterans a choice. Do they do they want to be seen um, virtually, or do they want to come in person? But we also figured out that there are other systems, like in our veteran readiness employment program, um, that we could use those to serve veterans um, remotely as well. So both on the employee front and on the veteran front, we've been able to do more in terms of service without, virtually without veterans or employees coming into the facility. Um, so that's a good question. So that's kind of where we are. Um, um, we learned a lot through the pandemic that we will apply well after the pandemic. So the, the reason I wanted to show you this slide is that I, I, I wanted to uh, highlight uh, so right now we have about 150,000 claims in the back of the world. So there's 600,000 claims in the inventory. So it's not backlog until it's 125 days. So this slide is shows you where the claims are by cycle. And the blue is for the non-NEMER Blue Water Navy cases and the red is for the NEMER cases. NEMER is based on Agent Orange and certain stip court stipulations that we have to follow for Agent Orange. So, so the point in showing you this slide is if you look at this, um, if you look at the different cycles, so a claim comes in and we <coughs> claim, then we sits in an evidence cycle. So we'll, this this evidence cycle is for the most part we're waiting for an exam. Or it could be we're waiting for federal records. And then it goes to a decision cycle where it's waiting for um, us to make a decision on the claim. And then it, it goes through the award and authorization cycle where we actually pay the benefit. So what I wanted to show you is the vast majority of our claims are sitting in the evidence cycle. That means we're actively working claims when they come in. We quickly work claims when they come in. We're, we're, 
development of items. But this is where we need to unstick claims that are in the system. That means bringing more to um, provide additional resources where veterans can get their exams done. Um, making sure that we can get records that we're requesting timely to support the decision. Um, but we also have a fair amount of claims in the decision cycle, and, and that's actually in a way a good thing, because that means that there's a lot of veterans' claims that are ready to request to make a decision. And uh, this is why, by the way, we instituted mandatory overtime, because we have a lot of claims that are ready for decision, um, and we need to make sure that the rating veteran service representatives, where the key decision makers are, uh, we have enough um, capacity to handle that work. And then very few are actually in the award or authorization cycle. Again, that's the end of this claims uh, processing system where we're actually paying the benefits through the system. Yes? On the, <clears throat> on the evidence cycle, I'm a new VSO. On the evidence cycle, uh, is that broke down? Like, is, it on, is that broke down on where where the log jam is, where the production jam is, or the process jam is? Is that broke down so that way, like, if we need feedback, it comes back to us, like through Steve or Tucker, you know, or how does that like? Yeah. How does that evidence, or how does that information get back so we can figure out if I need to get better at my job? Getting information so, turned uh, out. A lot of times, it's uh, what I would say if I were you, I was serving a veteran, helping a veteran just file a plan, it's making sure they report for their exam, you know, timely, so we don't have to re request the exam, um, just submitting evidence as soon as it's requested. So we might ask for a piece of evidence that you have custody of submitted and we can we can take action. But most of most of what's sitting in the cycle, if I were to break it down, I don't have the data would be, but uh, right. I would say most of what's sitting in the evidence cycle is stuff that we're waiting for an exam. Okay. So it could be an exam that's done by QTC or for the most part there most of our exams are done by the contract exams. Um, very few are actually done by DHA. But there are different contract. You might hear from the QTC, LHI, the different organizations that do exams. So our medical disability exam office is the national, has a national contract with all those exams, exam vendors. And uh, they ensure that the vendors are meeting the contract requirements. Um, and they're also assessing capacity and seeing if we need to increase uh, vendor capacity, which, by the way, we know we're going to have to do with the pack that way because there's going to be way more claims coming in the system. Otherwise, everything's going to queue up in the evidence cycle, and that's not going to be good. I got a beef about QTC and the whatever the hell we are. I live up north in the middle of nowhere. Okay, we've got 80 year old veterans. QTC, LT, whatever, calls in and says, we got an appointment for you to get a hearing test in Bellingham. So they want that guy at 80 some years old in the middle of winter to drive all the way down here to Anachi, go across the pass up to Bellingham, where the Bellingham is, for a hearing test. Yeah. Six hour drive. Yeah, that, so these guys try to change it and say, I can't. I have that problem. I have no family to take me. Can I rearrange my appointment? Next thing they know, they're getting a letter in the mail. You missed your appointment. We're going to drop your deal and reopen it again. That's my guess right there. Yeah, and that I've heard that same concern raised by other um, BSOs and other stakeholders. Um, so when you get, you know, obviously, it's probably not an isolated. But if, if you could give us some background on that, some of those claims, we can share that with the medical disabilities in office because uh, we, we want to we want to make sure we're spotlighting these example, these egregious examples like that where a veteran has to run for Wenatchee and Bellingham. That's ridiculous. 
Unless you're willing to drive to an inch. It's two-hour drive. But Bellingham, one of them, one of them, one of them, two-hour drive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
how, where do we find that at? You know, I mean, we're not telling them that giving them all the answers, but we need to say like, oh, you have a knee issue, and make sure you get this. Then otherwise, we're just Stop. helping you log in, because like, we're turning it in to get rejected back to go get the same information we already just told you. Is there like a booklet or something? Or? Well, uh, there are publicly available DBQs. Yeah, there are publicly available DBQs. And it, it, it's almost like when you go to McDonald's, it's a picture of a cheeseburger. It, it's, it's pretty pretty well spelled out. But it, it's also our rating schedule, so VA rating schedule. And that's actually pretty well spelled out uh, about what gets you 30%, what gets you 60%. Also, and I, I can't stress it highly enough. Uh, if if you do get a letter from us following your your claim, whether we granted it or, or whatever, our letters are really 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 detailed <coughs> on why we gave you this percentage versus what percentage. Okay? And um, if you're if you're not at the highest percentage, we'll tell you what you need, what would need to take place before you could get a higher level. So we were we were doing um, during the pandemic when we could do um, in person events like this. We were doing WebEx Wednesdays, where we were helping to provide stakeholders throughout our area with important information. So um, you you raising that question, um, you know, it, it's it's something that we might want to think about for future stakeholder calls. So thank you for that. Because I think this is the kind of stuff that we need to help clarify with you so that, that it helps, especially with the pack back, so that we're, we're getting the right DBQs and the right medical information. Because it is, yeah, it is rather complex. And that's, for the most part, why most consultation plans require um, an exam for our exam system because of the complexities of what we need in the case. Okay, so just wanted to give you that update on where claims are in the system. Um, and this is a breakdown of particulate matter claims, um, Gulf War particulate matter claims, claims pending, um, granted claims, and total particulate matter claims. So the good news here is that 75% of these claims are granted. Data that we had on that. And we've got common granted diagnoses, allergic rhinitis, you can see there, um, but also maxillary sinusitis, bronchi bronchial asthma, frontal sinusitis, and paris. And sinusitis. So, you know, this is not information that might be easily available for you to see, so we, that's why we want to share with you today. Okay, and now I want to give you an update on appeals. So, previously, before we, um, before the 2017 appeals modernization of all was in place, veterans, it was a very, um, 2019. Well, 2017 is when the law was passed, 2019 is when the appeals modernization law was signed into law by the president in 2017, implemented in 2019. But before that, um, veterans oftentimes had to sit in this legacy system that, that involved VBA making a decision and VBA making a decision. And it was very inefficient and it had no definitive beginning or end point. And what we found is that's what led to a lot of these, a lot of times when I go to town hall meetings and, yeah. and my claim has been in the system for 10 years. And they're right, but for the most part, those were appeals because they went claim would be adjudicated by VBA, they'd file an appeal, we'd go, to, go through our appeals process, which is a linear sequential system, one thing is that one before another. And sometimes those claims would go to VBA, they'd sit in VBA for a while, get remanded back to VBA. And you can see that would lead to long, long time delays. So it's a very inefficient system. Actually, the average wait time for a claim um, to receive an initial decision in the appeals process was up to three years. And 
that's that was the um, launching point for appeals modernization. And what appeals modernization provides is the veterans now have an ability to control how their claim is um, reviewed. So no longer does the claim have to be reviewed by BVA before it goes to BVA. A veteran can elect um, a decision to be reviewed directly by BVA, um, or they can use the appeals modernization choices that are available to them um, that are under the jurisdiction of BVA. So, um, if you so here's let me just simplify this. If you get a decision and you disagree with it, you can file a 10-182 and go directly to BVA, or you can use these choices to go to BVA and get your decision reviewed. And one is a supplemental claim. That's a 20-0995. That's a supplement. That, that's where you're, you're telling us, hey, I have more evidence. I'm going to submit more evidence. And I want you to look at this evidence and reconsider the decision that you just made. It protects your effective date and all that. So as long as you file it within one year. The other thing you can do is you can file a higher level review with BVA. And that's a 20-0996. And that's telling us that I don't have any other evidence to submit, but I disagree with the decision. I think the decision is not it wrong. And by electing a higher level review, you will have the ability to have a decision review officer, the most experienced um, decision makers that we have. We review that entire claim and arrive at a new decision. They may decide to overturn the prior decision. They have to know the review authority. So that means when you have to know the review authority, you can look at the exact same decision that the prior decision maker made and arrive at a different decision because you have the ability to review the same set of evidence. So that's the higher level review. And that's really what we do in Seattle. We're, so a higher level of reviews are done by the Decision Review Operations Centers, and that's here. And you can see there are three of them. There's one in Seattle, there's one in St. Pete, and there's one in DC. So that function used to be done by 56 offices throughout the nation. They've centralized it to three. So we're home. <clears throat> we're one of them. So um, we have great investment in making sure that we're providing you with all the information. And uh, we are proud to say that um, our team, since we implemented this in 2019, um, here we are in 2022, is a great update to provide is, is the fact that we, we are honoring the commitment to veterans. So the three-year the three year time frame we used to take on the legacy system to get an initial decision. Um, is done in actually a plus than 125 days. The average processing time for a higher level review is 34 days. So just imagine that. A veteran used to wait three years under the whole legacy system. And now, so far this year, the average processing time is 34 days. And uh, so it, it really is a great opportunity for veterans to, to decide how they want their review. Do, do they want the Supplemental, or do they want the higher level review? Um, or the other choice would be to go directly to the board. So, we're seeing a lot of veterans um, elect. This, this, is, this is how veterans have decided where they want their decisions reviewed. The vast majority are electing the board review. Um, and that's, so it's important to remember that while you're going directly to the board, there's a longer wait. Um, and I just mentioned that the higher level review, the average processing time is 34 days. So for the board, you have three different choices. When you go to the Board of Veterans Appeals, you can have it, there's three different dockets. There's a direct docket where you have no evidence to submit, you don't want a hearing, just want the board to make the decision that 
they have to know the review authority and they can make a decision that's different from what we be able to do. Or you can request a hearing or you have additional evidence to submit. The fastest of those three options to the board is the direct document and the requirement there is a do it in one year. But I would submit to you that the higher level review being done in 33 days or 34 days gives the veteran an opportunity to get a quicker decision and deviate before going to the board. So while higher level reviews are only 20.8% of the ways veterans have elected to get their decisions reviewed, um, that might be something you as a someone who's helping advise veterans um, can get a quicker decision to the Decision Review Operations Center higher level review. Again, that's where a DRO, the most experienced decision maker, reviews the same evidence. You can even request that an informal conference. You can't request that, you can't submit evidence. You cannot submit evidence in the higher level review link, but you can request a conference and use that to informal conference to identify where they may have been oversight in the laws and regulations as it pertains to the decision. And the cool thing about it is you can get a higher level review and if you're dissatisfied with the decision, you can still go to the board. Or you can, all of these are choices that you can continue to make. So one does not foreclose on the other. So that's the way the appeals modernization system was developed. And it may be confusing if you haven't heard about it before, but um, that's why I wanted to make sure that we provided this information to you. So basically, three different choices, board, supplemental, higher level review, and you can do all of them. Uh, but the one that's gonna get you the quickest decision is a higher level review. But if you have evidence, you're gonna wanna, you're, you're gonna wanna request a supplement by VBA or you can go to the board with additional evidence. Is there, what's uh, making the difference? The 33 to 116, what's, what? It's because, remember, remember that evidence cycle that I was talking about? Yeah. So a lot of this <coughs> stuff that's sitting in supplemental, um, we're ordering an exam. Gotcha. So, so remember, remember that other slide where I showed you this stuff that's sitting in the evidence cycle? I mean, this is, this is good, 160 days is, I mean, it doesn't look good compared to 33, but it's far better than what you're gonna, how long you're gonna wait going to the board. Um, you're going to wait many years before you get a decision from the board, um, especially if you request a hearing. Um, but again, I would emphasize that going to the board is a definite, absolute right a veteran has to go to the board of veterans' appeals. And I would urge every veteran to take advantage of any options available to them. But what I'm telling you is that none of this, if you elect any of these review lanes in VBA, you're dissatisfied with the decision, you can still go to the board and have the board of the appeals review the VBA decision. So that's the that's the way appeals modernization was designed to give maximum flexibility, maximum um, ability of the veteran to control how their decision is reviewed. So it's really a choice. The veterans get more choice than they had in the system. So we still have legacy appeals. So we, we Need to make sure we're working those as well. So. And yeah, and actually, one can can help the other. I think just a, just a quick story. There was one veteran we were helping, and we put in for a higher level review, and they they stayed with the original decision, but they said, I, I agree with the original adjudication adjudicated decision, but I disagree with some of their logic in the following three ways. And they said, if you had only submitted something very, very similar to what you did submit, then it would be approved, which led to us doing the, the supplemental, right? We did the exact, you know, that, that very, you know, very similar, but slightly different and information. The and then it was granted afterwards. So, and the effective date was protected. And the effective date was protected. So the high level review can sometimes give you those kind of useful tips for how maybe it went astray for the supplemental review. That's happened a couple times so and it worked well. One, that one year resets and you have to make a decision so you can 
So you want to submit that within the one year mm -hmm. to protect the infected. That's that's the key. So that's that's a good story there. <coughs> so yeah, I, I obviously I'm very uh, happy with the high level review since we do we're one of the three nationwide that do one of the three offices nationwide that is responsible for high level review. So really great work done by the CIOR employees where we have 104 DROs in 36 states. So we're uh, I mean, all of the all of those employees that used to work for other offices now work for Seattle, but they're remote. <laughs> so so we they what they did is they centralized the main the oversight of appeals to our office, St. Petersburg office and the DC office. So we're pretty proud of the fact that we've been able to essentially take what is the government version of the startup and make it very successful um, in terms of its implementation. A lot a lot went into designing it and executing it, but at the end of the day this is this is this 33 um, is telling you and the goal is 125. So we're far surpassing the goal. And by the way the accuracy is the same 96, 97 percent that I've shown you. So very highly accurate, very timely, and it gives veterans a quick decision. And as you just pointed out, you know, even if the answer is no, it might be it might lead you to understand how to get to the yes answer. If you ever have a question about appeal modernization, please contact us because you know we're in your own backyard and we're responsible for that. So we can definitely give you some further insights. If, if Steve gives me the information he needs, I can get back to get the doctor on that one sixteen down for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing about the one sixteen is that's done throughout the nation. Uh, that's not just done in Seattle. But we're responsible for this. This this is a shared workload with all of us. So literally, you could file a supplemental. It could be done in an office in another country. Whereas the higher level review is more, more likely than not going to be in Seattle. You say you can hold it to you. So um, that's why I have Maggie here. She is, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to being the change management agent, she is the face of the Seattle Argo in terms of uh, reaching out to stakeholders. So Maggie will provide her contact information. Is it maggie.shartel at va.gov? Margaret. Margaret, sorry. <laughs> Margaret. So you don't listen to me, listen to me. Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. Shartel. We'll write it down. And I will tell you many of our VSOs uh, and stakeholders do go to Maggie, and, and Maggie provides exceptional service. We have um, a thorough system in place to make sure that, um, that, in fact, there's a CMA mailbox that you can use to route your claim. So Maggie can provide that as well. If you don't want to go to her personal email, you can use it. And in fact, they should probably use the CMA mailbox. Forget the magic shows. <laughs> so, this is the, uh, a really great good news story for our legacy appeals. So, remember, I was telling you before appeals modernization, our veterans had to wait many years to get a decision. So that was the legacy appeals process. So we didn't want to forget about our veterans who had filed legacy appeals. And while the, it's great that we're processing in 33 days veterans who have filed under the new system, what about veterans under the old system? Right? we, we got to make sure that their cases are taken care of. Because many of these veterans have been waiting five, 10 years for a decision on their, on their appeal. So where it stood in February of 2019 when we launched appeals modernization was 400,000. And you can see where it is today. It's all the way down to 91,000. Eventually, this workload will be completely eradicated because there will, there is, you don't file a legacy appeal anymore. Now, if you file 
uh, or an appeal. It's under the appeals modernization. So this is a, well, a sort of a static workload that's shared between the board and VBA. So you can see the red is the board and the blue is VBA. So VBA has done a remarkable job of going from 268,000 to 28,000. So the board, you know, their number has gone from 116,000 to about 66,000. So um, you know, it's a shared workload, but uh, I would say that if you look at the VBA, you just look at the blue in the spar graph, you can see the remarkable job done by VBA to uh, work the cases that are under our jurisdiction. So definitely a good news story, but it's not a good news story if you're one of these veterans here who still got an appeal. We recognize that, so um, we're not going to we're not running a victory lap until we serve every veteran who has a legacy appeal. And some of those are being remanded by the board back to VBA because there's additional development that we need to do. So VBA and VBA still need to work together on that workload, but definitely. Um, something that will is our actually is our top priority in these legacy appeals. And now I just want to switch gears and update you on the um, veteran readiness and employment program. This is I think the best story ever told with the BBA because you take a, a veteran who has a service connected condition that's impairing their ability to be employed and they get to work with a, 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 a vocational rehabilitation counselor who has got a master's degree in counseling. And you get that one-on-one -on -one mentoring and um, uh, working with that counselor to make sure that they write a plan that allows the veteran to succeed. Um, so I don't know if any, has anyone, anyone got through our chapter 31 program? Oh, oh great. So you probably, Remember meeting with the counselor. Um, it wasn't you, know, you had that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the counselor. And hopefully, that one-on-one -on -one relationship worked well for you. It could be that we sent you to a school to get education, your vocational training, or something like that. But at the end of the day, the net result is a positive outcome because the veteran is employed, or they get to a point of um, maximum rehabilitation gain. Living or, or some other avenue of maximum gain, but for the most part, it's a job. So I think that's pretty cool that you know, we're taking veterans and we're helping them to become employed. And that's what this, that's what these metrics are. Uh, for, in the Seattle RO, we have so far we have 409 positive outcomes, and exceed the target by 20.6%, and 438 job ready to see. <coughs> Exceeds the target by 32 percent, and we process 2,590 applications. Those are veterans who have come to see us because they have service connected conditions that are impacting their ability to um, they're impacting them, <coughs> and they need our support in order to become job ready. And uh, that's the work that our counselors are doing. So, just a quick update on BRE where we are. So. Um, Definitely some, some great work we've done in our behavior program. And then some other important updates. Um, you can keep up with um, VA news through this website. Um, <coughs> quickly submit evidence to the new in intake tool for new claims. And uh, this is a big one. This, I hope everyone's aware that the, the crisis line number is now 988 plus one. And you know, we, much like ending veterans' homelessness, preventing veteran suicide is a shared responsibility that we all have. I think that it takes a, us as a community of providers coming together to support veterans who are at risk and um, making sure that we prevent veteran suicide. So, that's an important number if you didn't already have it. And I already showed you the, the previous slide, the PATH Act, the website to get the PATH Act. And uh, one thing that we're 
doing a lot of work in the DBA the caregivers program. While the caregivers program is actually under VHA, because of our expertise in processing claims, we're helping VHA with uh, the administration of the caregivers program. And that's, if you want any more information, uh, go to the website. And uh, yeah, so just we continue to do the work, the important work of serving our veterans and um, their families and beneficiaries in whatever way that we can. And it really is a, VBA more than ever before is a, um, not just siloed 56 regional offices, but one entity, one, entity, one enterprise with 56 different entities that is regional offices. And here are all the resources that you can use to contact us or get information that's relevant to VBA. So I know that I've spoken now for going an hour and a half and for five minutes. So I just wanted to thank you for your time today and uh, really appreciate the work that you've done so far. Uh, yes. All right, thank you, Brett. Uh, Seth Mayer of the Veterans and Military Families Program for ESD. Uh, fund all the DBOPs around the state that help your VRNE office get all the positive outcomes. Um, I have a, a few questions here. Uh, first, with the Agent Orange exposure. Um, I know that we expanded uh, those who become eligible or have presumptive conditions uh, based on the areas, but I haven't seen any movement in, um, in extending that presumptive to individuals that were stateside that did work on the, the aircraft and the, the damaged vehicles and stuff that were covered in Agent Orange, and those individuals are getting an exposure from it, but because they never set foot in Vietnam or any of those areas, that they're not given any consideration. And I've and I worked with several veterans that have the presumptive cancers, and but they're not getting any care for it because it isn't diagnosed as it being Agent Orange exposed. So the first part of that question is, is is there any? Is there ever going to be any movement towards that? Is that anything that's even being looked at for those individuals that weren't in country but were still exposed to the Agent Orange? You know, I, I think the way I've answered that stuff. So, if you looked at where we were maybe five years ago, recognizing these additional class of veterans that were presumptive of Agent Orange, it, it might have looked bleak. And now here we are today, recognizing them. So I think the same thing for the same. Um, that, this is where getting behind your elected member of Congress is critical to uh, driving that conversation because that's 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 where that conversation is best. Is we will gladly implement whatever right. Congress uh, plans. So the second part of that question is, um, you know, for that person, rules change down in the future, or even those individuals that were say exposed to Agent Orange for being in Guam. They've died, but they filed a claim initially that was denied. Are, are they going to, is their family entitled to anything if, if they've died? They filed an original claim, was denied, but now rules have changed that says that they should have, that they would have been, but they're not alive anymore. Is that family going to be entitled to any resources? Yeah, so, um, yeah, um, Agent Orange is really a it really depends on a lot of different factors. Um, and I can't adjudicate any claim right now. However, if, if I heard Fritz use the word gamer, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and for us, it kind of gives us a shudder because Nemer was a court case that made us go back to day one when the veteran originally uh, applied for benefits based on Agent R and exposure. So in those kind of cases, we had to really go in, in depth is the veteran still alive? If not, who's the next of kin? If there's no, who's the next of kin to the next of kin? And, and it was just, it was a, a crazy amount of work. So, uh, file, file those claims. You know, that that is my best. Uh, that's my best uh, guidance because before there were before there were Agent Orange disability in VA, there was nothing, and it took grassroots. Uh, people talking to our congressperson to get us those original disabilities. Then more, more work, more work, more work, and then here we are today. So keep fighting, keep filing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my final question: 
in regard to the PACT Act. Um, got veterans that had the initial diagnosis, the rhinitis or the asthma, uh, immediately diagnosed after separation. Um, and they filed the claim, but it was denied. Um, but now this has changed and there's a presumptive. There's mixed messages coming from VSOs on whether that person should file a claim because it could put their existing claim at risk, whatever their percentage is. <clears throat> and I keep getting back and forth stories on, yeah, you gotta wait 25 years before you file a supplemental claim, or no, you should file now, but you kind of put your existing claim at risk. Can, can you talk up about that a little bit, demystify it? We got VSOs in the room here, so we can break that river down. Your original claim at risk, I think, you know, I would, what I would strongly advocate is if you feel like is a benefit under the PACT Act that then you're now entitled to, to make sure you file a claim. We don't have these, all the effective date provisions finalized, and that's something that I talked about when we're still looking at all the regulations and getting all the regulations sorted out. But the message to all of you is I'm updating you on, the, on all the PACT Act presumptive conditions, and if you have anyone who you think you're serving who feels like they're qualified to file a claim, you're told. Make sure either it's adjudicated in a direct service connection or we wait until we get the reg regulatory guidance to do it on a presumptive basis. Okay, thank you. I'll make it quick. Um, I just really have a simple question. It has nothing to do with the PAC Act. At the beginning of your presentation, you talked about um, housing, right? Where would I access data that would reflect the current trends with HUD, VASH, SSVF outcomes driven from your guys' housing initiatives over the last couple of years. And I'm asking for the obvious reason, because coming out of COVID, I want more of a trend play and what we're trying to expect moving forward. Because it's kind of one of those things where the train wreck hit, and now we're trying to see what the aftermath looks like. That's a good question. I, I'll, I'll have Maggie work with you on I appreciate, appreciate that. Getting you some data on that. I just don't have that. All right, well, thanks everyone. Appreciate your time. Can we get Maggie's email?